They had to turn it up for the video, so now I'm super hot. Good to see you today. Uh, today we're continuing the book of Daniel. If you want to turn to Daniel chapter 5, we won't read every verse, but I'll try to go through the whole passage. Today we're going to talk about three signs that you are far from God. Three signs that you're far from God. And we're talking today about the writing on the wall. And so, um, you know, this morning I was driving here and I thought, uh, you know, that's a great illustration of us. I was driving here and um, I go down this one road that's a little back road on the way here. I don't have any lights. I drive almost 40 minutes here, 35. I don't have any lights till I get right here. And then there's five and I try to catch every single one just so I can relax and think about the joy of Jesus every day. And so that's what I was doing this morning. But anyway, so there's a little back road that I go on called Taylor Creek. It's a beautiful little drive. And so I'm driving down Taylor Creek and in front of me is a big old truck. And I see like a garbage bag hanging out the window. And I'm like, why is somebody hanging a garbage bag out the window? And then I look and the garbage bag is, it's a white garbage bag, is out the other window. And I'm like, what in the world? So I get a little closer and I realize it's not a garbage bag. It's a big white dog, big old dog head. It's a dog head that's this big. And the dog is going from one side to the other. And I just realized it wasn't on Taylor Creek. And here's why I know it's not on Taylor Creek, because we have a newborn donkey on the road on the way here. And so there's a mama and a newborn donkey. And uh, and the dog went crazy when it went past the donkey and was barking at the donkey. I saw this big head and then it would run back to the other side and bark at something else and then bark at something else. And I thought, you know what? That so often is like us. We're going through life, and if we're not careful, even as Christians, we can go from one thing to the other thing to the other. Oh, maybe this will make me happy. Maybe this will make me happy. And I'm going to share a little bit later in the service a very depressing statistic about Christians, the Bible, and social media. And how so often we think we're tuned into the right thing, but we're not. Billy Graham years ago said, Satan wants you to think you're a Christian when you're not. And Satan wants you to not think you're a Christian when you are. Now, I would take that one step bigger. I think the enemy wants you to think you're close to God when you're not. And to think you're far from God when you're not. And so we're going to look at three things that might demonstrate to you an area in your life where maybe you are far from God. And we'll look at this new leader. Last week, we looked at his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, in the Bible, often it'll say father, and the word actually in the Hebrew means forefather. So just know that when I'm reading it and I say father, it's forefather, because this was actually the person we're talking about here is the grandchild. His dad split the kingdom three ways, gave him or two ways, gave him half and he took the other half. I think the dad was all fighting. And the son, which would have been the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was partying hard. And that's where we pick up the story. So number one, one of the ways you know, you want to impress others, not God. So here's King Nebuchadnezzar's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He's home in the palace. He's a little bored. He decides to throw a party while Belshazzar, excuse me, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, I told you, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. By the way, what we know from history is that he invited pretty much everybody, ready for this, including the guys who guarded the gates not a real smart guy, this guy, okay? So, and then a few uh, verses later, they're partying it up. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared. Now listen, Steven Spielberg could not write anything better than this. I mean, if we were in here today, and all of a sudden a human hand appeared and started writing below one of the screens, I would get my attention. I would quit talking, which would be a first for me, okay? So, Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. By the way, I love details in scripture. I just think that's awesome. The king watched the hand as it wrote. Well, well, yeah. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. By the way, you can read a prophecy about this in Isaiah 
chapter 21. So if later you want to look up Isaiah chapter 21, this was prophesied, this exact thing was prophesied over 150 years before it took place by Isaiah. And then in chapter 44, Isaiah is very specific about who is the one doing this. So it's a pretty neat thing to look up if you want to, just to see how the Bible, uh, how prophecy is fulfilled in Scripture. Then it says, the king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners, and then he said to these wise men, which, by the way, is what we call these same group of people in the New Testament that most likely came from Babylon, because Babylon had gold, and it had frankincense, and it had myrrh. I know that's a shocker. It's probably unrelated. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. All right. So he said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple. You'll get a Mr. T starter kit. By the way, if you are on Twitter and you don't follow Mr. T, you are missing out. You need to follow Mr. T. It is awesome. Uh, anyway, and had a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now, why third highest? Because guess who's number one? Dad. Guess who's number two? Son. Guess who would be number three? You. Now, can I tell you what this is like? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. So, so here's what I know. Listen, if you're a believer... There are times, if you're not careful, that you try to impress others. Oh, Eric, I never do. Let me tell you how it works in a negative way, okay? And I know some of you have kids, some of you have grandkids. Let's say your kids freak out in a restaurant, okay? And you're going to correct them. Is your correcting of the children because you're concerned for the children or you're concerned about what everybody in the restaurant thinks? Because that makes a big difference with how you act towards your children. Now, that doesn't sound like a big difference. Eric, I was embarrassed by my kids. So you were more concerned by other people. You know why I can say that? Because I've disciplined my kids because I was more worried about what other people thought than my children. Did you know that's wrong? Now, I'm not telling you to let your kids go crazy in the restaurant either. Don't, don't hear me the wrong way, okay? Discipline your kids, but for their sake. You want them to be good citizens. You want them to care about others. You want them to be thoughtful, but not because you're worried about Sally Sue sitting next to you that you've never met. We sometimes worry more about people we don't know than people we know. But I know you're saying, no, no, I don't do that. Okay, so let me give you an Eric example, because Eric examples tend to be a little closer to home. So you're driving with your loved ones in the car. Maybe you're even having a conversation. Remember conversation? So you're talking about something. And suddenly in the rearview mirror, somebody's tailgating you. So you have a full conversation with this stranger in your rearview mirror about how they need to improve their driving based on your driving. Instead of caring about the people that are in your car, what are you worried about? You're Worried about the person behind you. Now, I understand you can be concerned about somebody tailgating you because you're concerned about the people in your car. But let's be honest, that's normally not your concern. Your concern is usually to correct their driving because we do the same thing with people that pass us going 10,000 miles an hour. We ask God for judgment on those people. And then if we're driving 10,000 miles an hour and pass a policeman, we pray for mercy. Isn't it funny how that works? So... You know, God will humble us when we start to think and worry more about others and impressing people. Years ago, I did a solo at a big church event uh, that probably had over a thousand people at it. And I didn't know the words to the song very well. They had just given it to me right before the performance. And so the music director um, uh, was my music pastor. And so I said, uh, uh, he said, listen, don't worry about it. Do the solo. I will mouth the words to you. I said, no problem. So I started the song. I started singing and they were trying to do this jazzy song, you know. So this was the, the 80s. So, you know, churches were trying to be cool with youth groups. So we did this song that kind of had this da, 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 kind of beat, you know. And so I'm supposed to get up and say, I finally had a And I get through the first line and I look at my music pastor and he is looking into the distance. I don't know what he's focused on, but he is not helping me at all, at all. So I'm standing there, have no idea what the words are. So I think it's time to scat. That's all I need to do. So I just went. Hey. And he looks back at me and goes. Oh. 
and starts mouthing the words. So then I came back in, looked like a doofosai. That's Greek for doofus. God has a way sometimes of bringing us to the place where we realize that we're not as awesome as we think we are. This guy was a guy who, listen, Nebuchadnezzar had to fight. He had to surround Jerusalem. He had to have conquest. This guy grew up, this king grew up in the lap of luxury. He never had to fight for anything. He never had to earn anything. He never had to work hard. He didn't have to do anything. And guess what? Because of that, he became prideful and lazy. And so here he was. And he was so not smart that he invited the people that were protecting him to party with him. Talk about somebody who wants to impress people. He brings his own bodyguards in and says, hey, come party with us. And so everybody's drunk. In James 4, 4, it talks about the world and it says this. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship, by the way, that's where we get the word Philadelphia. That's the friendship word. And it's just talking about being friends, brotherly love, right? City of brotherly love. With the world means enmity. That means hostility against God. Therefore, Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy. That's also the Hebrew word. The same word means hate. Anybody who's a friend of the world is an enemy or hates God. Enemy of God or hates God. Barna did a survey. I'm pretty sure it was Barna. Did a survey just a couple of weeks ago. And they went to church-going Christians. I'm not talking about people who call themselves Christians, who aren't really Christians. I get it. You know, everybody's like, well, I'm nothing else, so I guess I'm a Christian, right? We're talking about people who go to church, who claim to be Christians, who believe in Jesus Christ. And they did a survey, and they asked them three things. They asked them, how much time do you spend, or how often uh, uh, do you spend daily time on Facebook? How often do you spend daily time on YouTube? Which I was surprised by that one. And then number three, how often do you spend daily time in the Bible? Here's the statistics. 66% of Christians spend daily time on Facebook. Thirty-nine percent of Christians spend daily time on YouTube. And thirty Two percent of Christians spend time in their Bible every day. Do you see why we're having a hard time doing what God wants us to do? Because we look at him third, fourth, fifth. Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Why? Because we allow the world to tell us what our desire should be, what our goals should be, what makes us angry, what makes us happy. Listen, I want you to be informed. I want you to watch the news. But I want you to watch so much news that you're mad all the time. I want you to watch the news so you know what's going on. But I don't want you to watch the news so much that you're afraid all the time. You know, during hurricane season, I'm the kind of person that will turn the radar on and leave it all day. I'm a crazy person. And you walk in and you go, I think it wobbled. Uh, no, they've been playing the same thing. No, I paused the TV, Eric, three hours ago, right? You, you can't tell the difference, but you're, what are you doing? You're, oh, oh, I got to get worked up. And so we watch the news and literally they repeat the same line. Some morning, if you're a news watcher, some morning write down what they said. Write down one of the things they say and watch it at night and you will hear the same thing again. Why? Because they have a, this is our theme for the day. This is what we're going to scare people. This is what we're going to make people angry. This is what we're going to frustrate people about and get them all riled up. Why? Because then they'll watch a commercial. That's what it's all about. You think it's about they care about you. They don't care about you. But guess who does? God cares about you. He gave you his word. So when you read his word, he changes your focus. He changes your desires. So let's flip it. Let's make it 66%. Hey, hey, you ready? Let's make it 100% that every day. Hey, I don't care if you read one verse and write it on your hand. Don't tell the teachers I told you that. They used to hate when I wrote on my hand. But you write it on your so that during the day you continually go back to what? Communing with God. Why? Because otherwise people will pull you every other way. You'll be upset about somebody not doing what you think they should do. Or somebody doing what you think they shouldn't do. Listen, I'm going to love you whether you do what I want you to do or not. Did you know that? I'm going to love you if you don't like the music I like. I'm going to love you if you like music I don't like. I mean, I love people that love country music. 
I love people that don't like bluegrass because I'm weird. I like bluegrass and I don't like country. That is the weirdest. You got the weirdest pastor. All right, number two. Your pride blinds you from the truth. The queen hearing the voices of the king and his nobles. So the king freaks out. His knees are knocking together. He's losing his mind. The, I can't imagine what the conversation was like. Did you see that? All these guys come in and they're like, well, we don't know what that means, which is, which is awesome because don't you think there would be at least one person that would just lie? Like come in and go, yep, seen that finger thing before. King, that means you're going to be really rich tomorrow and just walk out, right? And he'd be like, okay, give that guy a, the Mr. T starter kit. But at least his own guys didn't lie to him. They said, we don't know what that means. And so now he's freaked out. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it says here, the queen hearing the voices of the king and his nobles. Now, I don't know how far away she was, but they were freaking out so she could hear it. Came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed, <laughs> which had to be like easy for you to say. I just saw a finger right on the wall. I thought it was because I was drunk, but everybody else saw the finger right on the wall. Do you see what's on the wall? Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. Isn't that awesome? Talk about a description. The guy's still pale. <gasps> I don't know what that was. But we might want to mute a few of those audio things. Don't look so pale. There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So he brings Daniel in. He does the whole thing with, hey, Mr. T starter kit, third of the kingdom. Now, you've got to realize, Daniel already knows what the wall says. But even if he didn't, Daniel's like, I don't want your stuff. It would be like if you were on the Titanic and it was sinking and the captain said, hey, how would you like to be co-captain? No, no, I'm good. Right? I mean, that's, that's, Daniel already knows what's happening. So Daniel looks at him, he says, he re starts reading the prophecy and he says, but you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had goblets from his temple brought to you. You and your nobles, your wives, your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the God of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see, hear, or understand. But you did not honor God, who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. What does Daniel say to him? He says, you know, God is not going to bless what you've done. Your grandfather, your forefathers knew who I was and you have forgotten and rejected me because you thought you had your act together. You know, all of us know, because we live here on the Space Coast, all of us know that we had two different shuttles explode. And they, after they exploded, they did inquiries into why did this happen? Both times, it came down to people who were in authority. Managers didn't listen to the experts. Managers said, well, we know better. And they got groupthink in that room and said, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Cold weather, O-rings. It'll be fine. Besides, we've got a payload order to keep up. And they launched the shuttle. They knew foam was hitting the shuttle. Oh, it'll be fine. And yet we know now that they were warned over and over again. It's easy for us to look at other people and go, yeah, I see the pride in them. But we never see the pride in ourselves. Did you know when people are having problems in their marriage, it's always caused by pride? But each person thinks it's the other person's pride. Because that's how we are. We're blinded to the truth. Listen to what it says in 1 John 2, 3 and 4. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. This word for keep means to watch, to keep an eye on, to guard his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. See, when I was in high school, I went to church. I did religious things. 
But I'll never forget when a youth pastor said to me, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. He said, what makes you a Christian? I said, uh, uh, I've made Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. You know, I'd heard that so many times that you just say it. He said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, well, it means that I made Jesus Lord and Savior. He goes, I know you said that already. What does that mean? And I had to think about it. And he was basically saying, have you allowed Jesus to be the boss of your life? If not, you can say you're a Christian all day long, but are you really? And so I had to humble myself and start to evaluate and say, God, am I really a Christian? And I'll never forget, I came to the point that I had to say, I don't know. And so at that point, I said a prayer that went like this. Lord, I don't even know if I'm a Christian or not, but I want to know from this point on that I know you. So I surrender my life to you, knowing that Jesus died and rose again for me. And Lord, if I'm not a Christian, I pray that right now I'd be a Christian. If I was already a Christian, well, I'm just... I'm just putting another anchor down to be able to say I'm a Christian. And about a year later, I realized that that was the point that I really made a real commitment to Christ. Because outwardly, even though there weren't radical changes in my heart and in my mind, there were radical changes. The main one being that I thought much less of myself and thought so much more of what God wanted me to do every day. And so I was actually baptized in a lake in front of a bunch of youth that I had led for years Many of those years, not as a Christian. And so I was baptized in a lake in front of 100 kids who thought, what's he getting baptized for? But I didn't care because I knew what I needed to do next. Number three, you think you are good without God. You think you are good without God. So every once in a while I'll ask somebody, are you a Christian? They'll say, yes. I say, what does that mean? And they'll say to me, well, my good outweighs my bad. Really? Tell me about that. And they'll say, well, I just try to do more good things than I do bad things. Oh. I've talked to people from other faiths and other religions. And they've, I said, they've told me they're going to heaven. I said, well, how are you going to heaven? Well, if Allah accepts me because I do these tenets, then I'll make it to heaven. Or if I do so many good deeds and, and do this mission and take care of this, then hopefully it will earn my way to heaven. Or if I light enough candles and I say enough prayers and I confess enough to my priest, then maybe I'll make it into heaven. See, this king thought that he was good enough, that he didn't have to worry about what God thought about him. Why? Because he was awesome. He was born as a prince, and now he was the king. But then Daniel tells him what the inscription means, and every bit of this inscription has to do with how your value is. And how you're being weighed. Listen to this. This is the inscription, Daniel continues, that was written. Meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. That's just fun to say. Here is what these words mean. Meaning, God has numbered the days of your reign. It's like a, somebody counting coins. He's numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Remember how they'd weigh money on one side and you'd put the weight on the other? And if it was less, you weren't valuable enough. You were left wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persian, which remember Isaiah had prophesied over 150 years earlier in chapter 44, specifically about one of those groups. Then at Belshazzar's command, listen to this, Daniel was clothed in purple. That's what they gave to kings. A gold chain, Mr. T. Starter Kit, was placed around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. See, what was going on already was that the Medes and the Persian were already cutting off the water flow. And in Babylon, Babylon had two walls. And in between the two walls, the river ran between them. And so they had diverted the water from the river. And they were going to march right in between past the first wall. But it was okay because there were gates on the second wall. And so the guards would put the gates up before they got there. When they saw the river was going, oh, wait a second. So history tells us that the drunk guards did not put the gates up. And so they came and they were already working towards coming right into the kingdom. That very night. Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. 
Listen, your good deeds, your prayers, your church attendance won't save you. Those are fruits. If you have plastic fruit, that does not make you a fruit tree. You can pretend to be a Christian. You can go to church. You can go into a garage and honk, but it does not make you a car. And you can go to church and sing all the right songs and say all the right words and learn all the right things to say and not be a Christian. But Eric, does that mean my good deeds have to outweigh my bad? No. Because no matter how much good you do, you will never be adequate for God's holiness. Ever. I don't care how many candles you light. I don't care how much you give to the church. Well, I care, but... By the way, I don't know what anybody gives if you're thinking I'm looking at you. All right. None of those things matter. What matters? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Is there an exception there for anybody? Is there an exception for some religious leader? Oh, they've never sinned. No. Is there an exception for somebody that you really like that you're like, no, no, Eric. You have never met that person. They are perfect. No, no. The Bible says all have sinned, and so because they've sinned, because they've messed up, and by the way, that word for sin is an archery term, you've missed the mark, and then it says, and fallen short. It's just like Daniel saying to that king, you've been weighed, and you're not enough. And so this verse starts out with terrible news for each of us. You are not enough. Congratulations. You ever feel like you're not enough? We've all woken up feeling that way. And the enemy will come to you, even as a Christian, and he will say, you're not enough. Oh, but wait, the story's not over. Listen, and all are justified. What's the next word? Freely. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything. You didn't make, what'd you do? Freely by his grace. When what happens? When redemption, that means, remember SNH green stamps? You go in with the SNH green stamps and you'd come out with a little AM radio. That's what I got, Right? You got to redeem. Jesus paid for you in the SNH store. If you don't know what that is, that's a Florida thing. Google it. By the way, Jill and Randy, good morning. They're watching from Iowa. Good to see you. But it says they were by his redemption that came through who? By my works? No. By Christ Jesus. Years ago, I remember talking to a neighbor who was, I believe, Jehovah's Witness. And as I was talking to him, he was talking about how he would earn his way to salvation and all the things that went along with that. And I said to him, you know what the Bible says? And I read this verse. And then we moved. And I never knew what happened. You know, all you're responsible for is planting seeds, right? And the next time I ran into them, I was in a grocery store. As I was going through the grocery store... His wife came up to me and said, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. Had no idea who she was. Took me a minute. Oh. She said, I just want you to know we both became Christians. And my husband is a pastor. God will ruin anybody. (laughs) What happened? You plant the seeds God wants you to plant. It's not by works. It's not by deeds. It's not even by being a nice person. It's by surrendering to the lordship, the boss Of Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, my best works are nothing. I surrender all to you. And the Bible says that he gives you his righteousness for your sins. The enemy wants you to think you're close to God when you're not. And he wants you to think you're far from God when you're close. Look out for those times that you're trying to impress others. Look out for those times that pride sneaks in. And be careful thinking that you can be good enough. Just Surrender. That's what the Christian life is about. Is there any area of your life you need to surrender today? If you're a Christian, just surrender that area. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you're not a Christian today, it's about surrendering your life to him. So you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. If you're watching online, you can send me an email, a note. Normally we have our time of offering now here, but you can give on the way out. If you're watching online, you can also give online. There's lots of ways to give. You can go to our website and do that. But I thank you for being here this morning while we go through this series in the book of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your strength and love for us. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would know that when we surrender to you, you draw us close. And that, Father, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So thank you that not only did you die for us in our worst state, you said that your blood purifies us from all sin. 
So Lord, thank you for that purification, for that love. We thank you that as believers, we no longer have to be ruled by sin. We are sinners, but no longer sinners, saved by grace. Help us to live that life of grace because of your redemption. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close our service. I hope it inspires and encourages you. Above 